The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to Matthew chapter 11. We'll be reading verses 16 through 19 and then verses 25 through 30. You'll notice that the title of the sermon is Rest for Your Soul, Not Rest for Your Eyes. So don't get any ideas, some of you. Though I will say I did have a brief moment where I thought, you know, it might be maybe even more beneficial one day to say the sermon today is just a nap. (laughs) Just take a nap. Let's all take a nap. You can tell people you went to church and you can't, you don't have to tell them you took a nap. We could all use a nap. You want to do that once? I shouldn't say that. I maybe shouldn't ask. But I I, I thought really seriously, maybe that's a, a better, better use of our time one Sunday. But today we listen now to the words, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 through 19, and verses 25 through 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon! The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear as you speak to us through the words of Holy Scripture. Lord, may we see what you would have us to see that we may do, Lord, what you call us to do, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, last Saturday, Sally, Cole, and I, we we spent the day with some of our dear friends over at Stone Mountain. And after being there in the park for a while, you know, riding some of the rides and seeing some of the sights, uh, we went over and and we visited with our friends over at their home for a couple of hours. And then we all had dinner together at a a nice little Thai restaurant attached to a Chevron station. So you know, probably authentic. But after dinner, and after saying farewell to our friends, we got back on the road heading towards our hotel where we would spend the night before getting up the next morning and heading on down the road to spend a few days on vacation. I remember as we were driving, before we got on the interstate, though, we stopped at a stoplight, and I heard Sally say, Wow, look at that. I don't think I've ever seen one like that before. I don't think I've ever seen one that bright before. She was looking over to the right, so I looked over on the right side of the road, and sure enough, there, arching through the sky, was that brilliant polychromatic reminder of God's covenant with creation, a rainbow. And I have to tell you, it really was. I'm sure it was the brightest one I've ever seen. You could see all the colors of Roy G. Biv, right? All of them there in the rainbow. And it was so bright, it was actually a double rainbow. There was the bright, bold rainbow, and then right above it, uh, not as bright, but still clearly visible, rainbow. Sally was wowed by it. Cole was watching Curious George, had his headphones on, was like, meh, rainbow. (laughs) But Sally was just amazed. But me, I I tried my best to dull the edge 
of its brilliance by explaining, you know, rainbows uh, can only be formed at certain hours of the morning or afternoon when the sun is at a certain angle to the horizon uh, and when there's enough precipitation in the air and, and its brilliance is only determined by the distance and the directness of the sunlight through a certain saturation of precipitation causing a certain prismatic function to form on the opposite horizon of the sun. You know, interesting stuff. <laughs> stuff nobody has any reason to know except people, I guess, who study rainbows and light. But what was I doing? What was I doing? The same thing we all do. The same thing we all do with the simple, glorious gifts of this life. We all but ruin them by overcomplicating them, overexplaining them, and Lord forbid, overanalyzing them. We're too ready to take these gifts we're given and explain them away and not simply appreciate them for what they are in the moment that God gives them to us. We do it with everything from rainbows to butterflies to purple and orange streaked sunsets. We try to explain them away or to understand them. Why we even do it with the simple gifts God grants us in our lives of faith. Now, I suppose it starts out innocently enough. It's an itch we need to scratch, a, a curiosity that sort of compels us to ask questions, to determine motives and meanings, why and how things work. We take something we've been given, and we want to figure it out. Sort of like how when I was 9 or 10 years old, back when my mom used an awful lot of Aquanet and a hairdryer, which I'm pretty sure is a fire hazard. Okay? I remember I wanted to know how does that how's a hair dryer work so I took it outside and I don't remember if I used a screwdriver I just slammed it on the driveway and looked at the guts of that thing like oh I have no idea <laughs> I couldn't just be satisfied with the fact oh yeah it works at least it used to it starts with a curiosity right a desire to understand why or, or how something is rather than receiving it with thankfulness and, and sharing it with others. Wait a minute, what is this? How did I get this? What is this all about? It's not enough for us to simply receive God's grace. We want to know how we receive God's grace. How is God's grace imparted to us? You may say, Chris, I don't lose sleep over that question, but the church has for thousands of years. Does it come through the sacraments? Is it predestined, predetermined, foreordained? Does it come through saying a sinner's prayer? Does it come through baptism, the laying on of hands? It isn't enough to just simply welcome the gift from God. It isn't enough for us to simply acknowledge the mystery of God's existence, whether in the Trinity or, or whatever other way we think it may exist. No, we've got to dissect it. We've got to prove it. We've got to understand it. We've got to label all other things we know as wrong to be heresy. It just isn't enough to live in the mystery. It isn't enough to have faith. We've got to have doctrines that define our faith, rules and regulations that tell us and others what our faith is all about and whether they're in line with us or not. It may start out as a compulsion of curiosity, but it so often leads to lists. Lists of rules, regulations, and restrictions. It's then that we lose sight of the simplicity of God's good and gracious gifts. What starts out as maybe just lines or rules to understand something quickly turn into walls and barriers that separate us. And you know, I think that may be what Jesus is actually getting at in these verses, the first verses of our text this morning. Jesus says, To what will I compare this generation? Like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another, We played the flute for you. We tapped it out with our foot. We got up, started jigging a little bit. And you didn't dance. And we wailed. And we cried. And we tugged on your jacket sleeve. And we begged you for a penny. And you didn't mourn. It seems Jesus is saying that we're the kind of folks who are so busy looking around for something. 
looking around for whatever, whatever axe we have to grind, that we miss the sound of the flute calling us to dance, or the sound of those wailing calling us to mourn. We can be so caught up in desires like doctrinal purity that we ignore the music of God's calling, that calling to come and dance, to rejoice in the presence of Christ, to find joy in the reality of Jesus' unfailing love. We can be so obsessed with our right thinking and the right thinking of others that we can grow deaf, deaf to the cries of our sisters and brothers who live in poverty and despair. We can become so fixated on whatever sin we find most egregious that we can't hear the wailing of others who've been locked outside, kept at a distance, forced to the margins. All the while, God mourns for them and for us. I think that's what Jesus is driving at in this short little parable. That we can become so engrossed in the complexities of life and faith complexities we have created that we miss what God has placed right in front of us. That we can miss the simple truth of the gospel. What may be most unfortunate about such short-sightedness, though, is that it tends to paint us into a corner, a very tight, lonely corner. You see, we can become so focused on these sort of things that we begin to draw those lines and erect walls meant to clearly outline what we believe is right or wrong, what's in and out. But so often what winds up happening is that we close ourselves in. We close ourselves inside of a box that really we don't even belong in. The rules, regulations, restrictions, doctrines, whatever you want to call them, that we, we build, that we create, so often become contradictory. And when that happens, it's often too late for us to recognize the foolishness inherent in our own actions. I think that's what Jesus means here too. I think that's what he's getting at when he speaks about his cousin John and himself in verses 18 and 19. He says, John came, didn't drink. He was a Baptist after all. John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he has a demon. Now, John, look, we know, we know, don't eat pork, don't eat shellfish, don't ever eat a cheeseburger. You can't eat, you know, the milk of a kid with it. You don't do that stuff. But come on, just locust and wild honey, you got to be crazy. And it's perfect. It's in the Bible. You can drink wine, John. You're crazy. John came neither eating nor drinking, and he must have a demon. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus, if you're going to eat with them, they have to sit at this table and you have to sit at this one. Jesus, if you're going to eat with them, you better wash the dishes. You don't want to catch their uncleanliness. Jesus, these are the rules. He's crazy. He doesn't fall in line. He's crazy. The religious folks of the day had decided that John was a quack because of his overreaching dietary restrictions and his abstinence from alcohol. But the same folks also criticized Jesus because of his more liberal approach to food and drink and the people in, with whom he shared it. You see, we can begin to outline and define so many religious rules and restrictions, telling ourselves that it's good for us, that it's good for the community, that it's good for everybody, that many of those rules and restrictions will begin to contradict each other or they'll begin to contradict the social mores and cultural norms of our society. And we will either choose to ignore such contradictions, using them to our own advantage when the proper situation arises. You know, John, John abstained, he's crazy. You know, Jesus partook, he's crazy. Or we will easily give them up. When that contradiction arises, we will easily give up our convictions for what makes us comfortable or surrender them in exchange for that which does make us comfortable. We will proclaim things like the truth of the forgiveness of our own sins, but decry the sins of those who we see as far less than us. And can I tell you something? That's a heavy burden to bear. That is a heavy burden to bear. 
to be the judge of everybody, to feel the weight of responsibility for the righteousness of those we've deemed outside the lines, to feel as if we are the lone crusader out to rid the world of sin and to call everyone to repentance and a life of right living, a life that looks an awful lot like ours. It's a wearying task. It's a wearying task to be the one who stands on the soapbox at the precipice of the future, attempting to stem the changing tides, to hold back the seemingly inevitable, to be the one with a new cause every week, a new effort each month, a new bone to pick every day. And folks, can I tell you something? I know too many of us in this room, in this world, too many of us, who are carrying around such burdens. Too many of us who believe it's up to us to preserve this complex system of rules and rituals, this institution that we've been given. Too many of us are buckling under the pressure. We can't take it. Too many of us are losing sight of the reason we ever felt called to such a path of discipleship in the first place. Too many are struggling under the weight of the yoke that we've made for ourselves. A yoke of self-righteousness and self-judgment. There are far too many who are struggling with the delusion that it's all up to me, that God is counting on me to do it all, to make everybody right, to set everybody on the right path, as if God can't do it God's self. There are far too many of us struggling under the burden of religion and all of its trappings, trappings we've created with our desire to be comfortable, desire to create comfort for ourselves and our own people and judgment and damnation for everybody else. We've labored under this yoke for far too long. And the truth is, it's killing us. We're only sinking under its weight. So many of us are tired, exhausted. We're on the brink of giving up. And I want to tell you something, and it's the truth, and I hate that it's the truth, but so many already have. And so many in my generation and younger don't even want to take it up in the first place. Some are angry. Some are defensive. Others are frustrated, and still others are confused, broken, and afraid. But all of us, so many of us are just plain worn out from all of what we might label as religion these days. But when that burden has dragged us to the ground, when our very souls feel too tired to carry on, Jesus says, Come to me, all you that are weary, All you that are carrying heavy burdens, the heavy burdens of trying to do it all yourself, the heavy burdens of all the weight of conflict and confusion, those of you who are trying to carry all the heavy burdens of your life and the lives of others around you, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. My message is simple. I'll play the flute and I want you to dance. I'll wail and I want you to mourn for your sisters and brothers. It's simple. I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me. Those are Jesus' words of invitation. They're words that are an invitation to discipleship, an invitation to rest. Christ's call is a call to lay down the burdens we've heaped onto ourselves, to let go of this notion that we somehow, we are the ones who will keep this whole history of Christianity from careening off the cliff. Jesus' call is one to let go of our created complexities of religion, To take up the easy yoke of love. Love for God and for all others. Friends, I am convinced that too many of us are carrying around with this burden of religion. The weight 
of doctrine, the heft of right and wrong, of do's and don'ts, and we're buckling, our knees are trembling, we're about to give up. Too many of us are laboring under the load of proof text and the various isms that we've created to explain why and what we believe. Too many of us are weighed down with the perceived sins of others, trying to correct what we see as their greater sins. And every one of us is labor, every one of us that is laboring under such a yoke, we have to be exhausted. So surely, if you're laboring under such a yoke today, you've come into this place exhausted too. Your soul is tired. So let me invite you, as Christ did, to lay down those burdens. To let go of that long list of things that you keep heaping on top of yourself. That long list you've written in your mind of what's right and what's wrong. To cease worrying yourself to death over things you cannot change. Over things that must change. Over things that will never change. Let me invite you this morning to give up whatever weight it is that keeps you from experiencing the simple and good gifts of God. Simple gifts that Christ gives us and Christ calls us to simply share. I invite you this morning to come to Christ, the one who promises to give you rest from your self-made burdens, the one who promises to give you rest in the simple, powerful, and beautiful reality of His unending love. I invite you, as Christ did, to take up His yoke, to cast aside your own, and follow Him on this eternal journey marked by the words of the Apostle Paul. Faith, hope, and love. Of which the greatest and perhaps simplest gift is love. Christ calls you this morning to lay down the burdens you've made for yourself and to take up His yoke. A yoke of love. A gift for you and for you to share. Won't you come? Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us a calling this morning to lay down the yokes, the burdens, the weight that we carry that we have heaped upon ourselves. God, weight that has come upon us as we have sought to take the simple gifts you give us and to make them more complicated, to build walls around them, Lord, to not see them as the good gifts they are and to share them with everyone. Lord, help us now in this time to respond to your invitation to come, to lay down our burdens, to take up your yoke, to find rest in you. Holy Spirit, help us to release those things and to find the joy and rest in your eternal love. Be with us, Christ. We pray in your holy name. Amen.